<clears throat> okay, so before I go into the discussion today um, about how to optimize your health, I like to start out with a story with Janet, uh, of Janet. Um, I usually like to, to talk about a story because it helps to um, solidify what we're going to talk about. And it, it gives people encouragement. I, I, that's what I really want people to uh, get from today's presentation and understand that what we talk about today is are things that you can Im Im include in your life um, to make your reach the state of health that you, you deserve. Um, so I'm going to start out with talking about Janet. And Janet is someone that I had the pleasure of, of uh, working with. Um, I have the pleasure of working with many people, but I wanted to share Janet's story because I think her story is applicable to what I'm going to talk about today. So Janet is a 54 year old female uh, who came to me with osteoarthritis in both knees. She had a hypertension, type two diabetes. Her BMI was uh, 35. She was um, quite uh, just, really, as she said, a, a mess. Um, she was uncomfortable. She had uh, pain throughout her whole body. She um, uh, also had brain fog. She, she had fatigue. She just wasn't healthy. She didn't feel her best. And I, I worked with her for quite some time to uh, get her to the state of health um, that she's in now today. And, um, and so we're going to talk about the things that Janet did that put her in that situation and some of the things that she did to uh, get out of it, too, because I want each and every one of you to know that you do not have to be a slave to chronic disease. And Janet believed that and she implemented a lot of what we worked on and she is a happy camper today. So what was going on with Janet is this, this thing called in inflammation. Um, persistent inflammation is the common pathogenesis of many chronic diseases, including cardiovascular, bowel disease, diabetes, arthritis, and cancer. Um, Janet was in a state of inflammation and as most people are, if you have any chronic disease, you probably have um, a state, you're in a state of inflammation. Um, so what we see here in the schematic are the, on the left, the triggers for this, uh, this systemic chronic inflammation that people have. Um, on the left, you see obesity, physical inactivity, the Western diet. And some of these triggers were actually triggers for, um, for Janet as well. Um, she, as I mentioned, her BMI was 35. She didn't eat anything green. She, she really um, did not like any fruits or vegetables. Um, or if she did, it was way too much sugar if she had smoothies. Um, but she ate typically a Western diet. Um, she was under a lot of stress, a lot of stress. And here's the thing, um, stress, yeah, cortisol, long Long-term chronic exposure to cortisol is never healthy, it's inflammatory. And Janet was one of those people who was always under a state of stress. And, um, and I wanna mention too, cortisol is, is actually anti-inflammatory, but it's when it's long-term exposure to it that it becomes uh, more inflammatory to the body. She didn't sleep. She was one of those night owls who would stay up late so she had a number of triggers. And, and here's the thing. There's a lot of things that are usually taking place in a person's life before they reach, um, before they turn into uh, having a chronic illness. Let's see here. It looks like my, I don't see my screen. <clears throat> So there were a number of triggers that were taking place in Janet's life that really, really put her body into the state of inflammation. And, um, and, and that's one of the jobs that I do. I try to educate people about why they're sick. Um, and, and, and if you have any of these, uh, live these lifestyles or you eat this kind of way um, with the Western diet, then you know, you have to understand that this is eventually going to catch up and lead to um, some kind of inflammatory condition. So in the middle, um, in that schematic, you have systemic uh, 
chronic inflammation. And that is the result of longstanding um, practices, either from what you're eating or just the lifestyle that you're living. Um, eventually that will turn into um, a, a chronic illness on the right. So there's usually things happening um, before you get into the state of chronic disease. Um, and that was the case for, for Janet, as most, most people have, have this situation going on. Um, so I had to educate her. And, um, and this is what I want all of you to know, that if you have any of these conditions, um, there's usually something triggering it. There's always some kind of mediating um, process that's really driving these disease states. So one of the things that I um, focused on, and I, I normally do with most people that I work with, is what you're putting in your body. We have to start with that because what we put in our body can dramatically impact the state of health that we um, we we have. And um, and so in terms of uh, Janet and how she was eating, uh, the Western diet was the the primary diet for her. And, um, and this diet is known to promote inflammation. It's high in red meat, processed meats, sweets, french fries. Um, and it's actually been connected. Uh, there's a direct association with increased inflammation uh, measured by CRP and IL-6, which are inflammatory markers. And it promotes endothelial damage. So it, can, it does have the um, ability to impact the uh, vascular uh, uh, tissue and, and promote cardiovascular disease. It's low in omega-3 fatty acids and natural antioxidants, fiber and found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, and so this is the way most people eat, <laughs> unfortunately. And this is the reason why so many people are inflamed because these foods if, if they're low in antioxidants and, you know, the phytochemicals that help to mitigate the effects of oxidative stress, then you're going to have some kind of, um, there's a consequence to that. And that's what um, Janet began to learn as we um, changed her diet to help uh, with minimizing inflammation. So, um, this is really important, advanced glycation and products. Um, so Janet really, really loved to eat um, red meat, uh, <laughs> grilled meats. And, and it's important to know that uh, dietary advanced glycation and products are these uh, compounds and products that form uh, when um, cooking meat and fat and, and protein, they form. Um, it's something that can, is known to contribute to increased oxidative stress and inflammation. And here's the consequences to these things. If, if, this, is, um, any, if this is something that you consume, um, what happens is when they advance glycation in products, uh, dietary sources uh, come in, they, they bind to these receptors that are found on the, um, the vessel wall, the smooth muscle, they're, they're found on our macrophages. And when the macrophages come in contact with these advanced glycation end products, they can promote inflammation. There's intracellular cascades that are activated when these advanced glycation end products bind to these receptors. The reason why they're so bad is because if it's inside the blood vessel, and you're having any kind of inflammation um, as a result of the immune um, system coming in contact with these advanced um, glycation end products, then you're going to have inflammation um, happening inside the blood vessel. And that's never good. Um, it's going to promote cardiovascular disease. And it also, um, there's a similar mechanism that happens in a brain. These advanced glycation end products are able to cross the blood brain barrier and promote um, inflammation there by coming in contact to the, with the microglial cells of the brain. So uh, these advanced glycation end products, uh, dietary sources, you really want to minimize. And this was one of the things that I had to focus on with Janet is making sure that we reduce these, uh, these uh, dietary sources of these um, compounds that are known to increase inflammation. Other um, compounds that um, affect um, how your body works and promotes oxidative stress are heterocyclic amines, and they're known mutagenics, or they, they're, um, 
they're found to be immunogenic, meaning that it affects our DNA and promote oxidative stress. This is never a good thing. And they're formed um, when meat products are cooked at high temperatures, um, beef, pork, fish, poultry. And, um, and so they promote oxidative stress. And this was another component to her diet. Um, and so here's what we see here is a, a group of um, heterocyclic amines. And FIP in particular has been studied. Um, it's quite interesting, this particular heterocyclic amine. Um, it's known to have estrogenic effects. And this is actually not a good thing because if you have a hormone uh, sensitive condition such as breast cancer or prostate um, issues, the, 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 the issue here is you don't want anything that's going to stimulate estrogen um, in, in the body. And so FIP here, you could see it actually can be as stimulating as pure estrogen. And that's, um, you know, this brings up another point. Um, xenoestrogens are uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they have the ability to uh, mimic estrogen in the body. So you really want to um, mitigate or reduce your exposure to any dietary um, sources of uh, estrogen that would be more um, disease promoting. And in this particular study, what was interesting was that they found that FIP is actually collecting, um, it infiltrates the ducts, which is the most common type of breast cancer in women, um, ductal carcinoma. Um, and so women, uh, if you're consuming any of these foods um, and that, you know, produce these heterocyclic amines that can um, concentrate in breast tissue, um, it's never a good thing. The microbiome is um, really um, a fascinating um, area of research. And um, we know that the microbiome has a humongous impact on virtually every part of our, our body. There, in the colon, we have um, 300 to 1,000 different species of bacteria. And we know that we can influence the microbiome from what we eat, um, our lifestyle and um, environmental factors. There's so many things that can impact the microbiome. And so what's interesting um, in terms of dietary um, impact or influences on a microbiome, there is a study that um, that found that a four week high fat diet chronically increased plasma levels of LPS concentration. Um, this, is, this is really, really um, fascinating. This LPS is an endotoxin. Um, it's found on the cell membranes of gram negative bacteria. It's supposed to be there, it helps the bacteria communicate and, um, and signal to one another. But what's interesting is that this LPS can actually translocate from the digestive system into the circulatory system and cause um, all kinds of uh, cardiometabolic uh, diseases um, such as um, atherosclerosis. It can um, increase the risk for uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, and, and it also plays a role in um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it can impact the liver. So what we're seeing is gut health, the microbiome, gram-negative bacteria in the digestive tract having an impact on our cardiovascular system. Um, and this is what's, what's happening. So the LPS um, is supposed to remain in the digestive tract. But what happens is sometimes it goes into the circulatory system. And there are several mechanisms by which that happens. Um, but one is known as intestinal permeability in which the enterocytes, the cells that help bind um, the enterocytes are tight junctions. And whenever there's any compromise to this intestinal epithelial barrier, you can see the LPS go through. And it's not depicted here in the schematic, but it goes through those cells and once it goes into the bloodstream, it's able to uh, interact with lipid binding proteins and, um, and lipoproteins. And uh, when that happens, then um, it comes in contact with the immune system, the macrophages, they start to produce these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, the liver tries to handle it. The LPS goes into the liver and it actually, um, copper cells are the immune cells of the liver and they try to clear the LPS, but in doing so, um, they create collateral damage to the hepatocytes 
and create, uh, you know, uh, fatty liver. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that happens um, as a result of trying to clear the LPS. And um, the LPS one is bound to our lipoproteins such as the HDL or LDL. LDL can become oxidized, it goes into the arteries and, and there you have it, atherosclerosis. Um, and then the LPS can actually signal to adipocytes to proliferate. And, and that's the connection there with obesity. Um, and this is all coming from LPS and endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria found in a digestive tract having such systemic impacts on um, the human body. Um, so what you see here in a healthy artery, when there's any oxidized um, LDL, it's removed by macrophages and it dumps into the lymphatic system. But in atherosclerotic disease, the oxidized LDL actually um, does not get removed and it's bound if it's bound to LPS, that can also um, interact with the immune system. So you have this um, inflammatory cascade of reactions happening inside the um, blood vessel. And then you see foam cells produced, which are these macrophages that have engulfed cholesterol. So that is the precursor to atherosclerosis or plaque formation. So as you see, um, LPS plays a role um, in atherosclerosis. And this is a, a, a big deal. So keep in mind, we're talking about the microbiome. We're talking about gut health impacting cardiovascular health, um, uh, impacting obesity. Um, so LPS is definitely something, um, or gut health, I should say, is definitely something to consider as a target um, to address when you're dealing with any kind of cardiometabolic disease. So visceral fat is um, a, a really big um, issue. It's uh, it, it, the way, a very simple way to know if uh, you have visceral fat is to uh, measure your waist to hip ratio. And the bigger your, your waist, um, the more visceral fat you have. And um, the truest way is to do a CT scan or MRI, that's too expensive. So a very easy way is to um, measure your waist to hip ratio. And, um, and so visceral fat, the reason why it's so dangerous is because it's actually inflamed tissue. Um, there are macrophages or um, immune cells inside the adipose tissue. And when in obese tissue, the phenotype of macrophages change into an um, inflammatory type. And so you start to have a production um, of, of these pro-inflammatory cytokines inside adipose tissue. And that, of course, um, sends other cascades and increased the risk for cardiovascular disease. So um, high, you know, having a lot of visceral fat is extremely inflammatory uh, to the body. The other important aspect too is that adipose tissue is um, also, um, I should be more specific, white adipose tissue um, is an endocrine organ. And the reason being is because it actually, there are hormones that are secreted from fat tissue. Um, and in particular, this is one of the reasons why obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer, because the, um, there's an enzyme inside adipose tissue called aromatase and aromatase converts, um, it, it makes more estrogen. Um, and uh, that's never a good thing. Um, in women who are postmenopausal, um, fat tissue tends to be the source of estrogen in these women. Um, so it's, uh, you, you have to deal with the visceral fat um, it is inflamed tissue. It does increase your risk for cancer and cardiometabolic diseases. Um, and it's because it's very inflamed tissue um, and it's uh, metabolically active tissue as well. Now, how do you deal with this visceral fat? Because this is a problem for a lot of people. Well, we first start with what we're putting in our bodies. It's really important. Uh, eliminating vegetable oils, increase the consumption of plant-based foods. Um, vitamin D deficiency, um, vitamin D, we have to remember vitamin D is not just a vitamin, it's a hormone, it's a steroid hormone. Um, and so it plays a role in regulating calcium as, as well as other uh, uh, cell um, processes. 
And, um, and so uh, uh, it helps to um, support thermogenesis as well as um, lipid or fat oxidation. So uh, correct in vitamin D deficiency and um, calcium because it, it regulates or meta um, the metabolism of calcium. So that's really important to address when dealing with visceral fat. The other thing, of course, is physical activity. You have to get moving so that you can burn that fat. In particular, you wanna do strength training because strength training can um, burn fat and build muscle. So you wanna do that and um, at least 30 minutes per day of moderate exercise. And this is, this is really important. Stress, you have to deal with stress. You have to make sure you're lowering that cortisol because the cortisol preferentially attacks the um, at least in terms of increasing um, visceral fat, it targets the abdomen. And, um, and so we have to get the stress levels down. You have to get your cortisol levels down. Me personally, I like to, um, I do the infrared sauna uh, three times a week. And that's something that um, has been extremely uh, beneficial for me and reducing my stress. Um, and then I also would wake up in the morning and walk five miles um, at a lake. And I, I got my early morning uh, sunlight exposure and I try to practice turning out the lights at night um, so that I can lower my cortisol in the evening so that I can have healthy production of melatonin. So uh, making sure that you're not spiking your cortisol unnecessarily um, is really important to deal with um, the consequences of high cortisol. This is uh, really important. I, you know, I get this a lot from um, people that I work with. Somehow people think that um, just because mom or dad or uh, your aunt had a chronic illness, you're, you're, in, you're supposed to have one. Um, you're, not, you're not a slave to any chronic disease. In fact, a large majority of chronic illness um, is caused by the, um, the environment, our lifestyle, 90 to 95% and five to 10% is genetic. <clears throat> so Professor um, Judith Stern at University of California Davis says, genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. And that's, that's, that's absolutely true. I, I see it a lot. Uh, when you change the uh, modifiable risk factors that are associated with disease, a lot change with your health. The American Institute for Cancer Research is an organization that provides information to the public regarding um, cancer prevention and even supporting cancer patients um, as they go through their treatment on what foods can be very beneficial with, for their specific type of cancer. And they state diets that revolve around whole plant foods, vegetables, whole grains, fruits, and beans cut the risk of many cancers and other diseases. And, uh, it, and so I, I want to stress that when you are looking to optimize your health, it's really important to pay attention to what you're putting in your body because it could either drive disease states or it can heal you and give you optimal health. 90% of type two diabetes, 80% coronary artery disease, 70% of stroke, 70% of colon cancer are, prevent are pre potentially preventable. That means if we address the modifiable risk factors, including physical activity, our uh, dietary practices, um, uh, uh, handling uh, getting the obesity under control, uh, moderate, uh, you know, no alcohol, <laughs> no alcohol, um, you can actually see significant changes. I see it all the time. When we make these changes in people's health, all of these conditions go away. They go away. And that was the case for Janet. She's now off all of her medications, no more blood pressure medication, no more insulin, She's off her statins. She lost more than 35 pounds 
she's just living life and she's enjoying it all because of making these changes to these um, these risk factors, these triggers. So it starts with understanding that food is information. Food is information. We have to change how we um, we look at food. Most people think food is, oh, we just take it in because it tastes good. Yeah, it's supposed to taste good, but food is information. That's really important to keep in mind. Food is information. And I'm going to show you how food is information. And I'm not going to go into this particular pathway here. I'm not going to make this a, a, a um, science lecture, but I just want to illustrate this point here. This is the homocysteine methionine pathway. Your body has pathways, biochemical pathways that drive its physiology. What we see here is the, the, this pathway that requires B vitamins, okay? B vitamins, B6, B12, um, uh, folate. This, this pathway here is so important. And if there's any deficiency in your B vitamins, any deficiencies, you can run the risk of having these intermediates accumulate. Homocysteine, for example, Elevated homocysteine is connected to cardiovascular disease. It's a biomarker for cardiovascular um, disease. And so if you have high amounts of homocysteine, it actually causes damage to your, your arteries. It, it's inflammatory to the body. And so this is an example. This is just one example of when you, the need for B vitamins and the role that B vitamins play in a biochemical pathway. But that's just one. We also see B vitamins and magnesium playing a role in GABA produ production. GABA is a neurotransmitter. We need it for our mood. And so low levels of GABA has been connected to mood disorders and anxiety. And B6 and magnesium play a role in GABA production. And there's 3,750 magnesium binding sites throughout the human body for magnesium and over 300 enzyme reactions require magnesium. Guess where you get magnesium? You get magnesium from your green leafy vegetables, your legumes, your beans. And if you're not eating these foods, then you're not gonna have the magnesium that you need to drive these uh, biochemical pathways. If you're, and, and, and this is another important point, I wanna mention this too, is that uh, a lot of times people are taking medications that are causing drug induced nutrient deficiencies. And so if you're, you're taking like oral contraceptives, they deplete your B vitamins. That's a problem. If you're doing, taking a PPI, that's going to deplete your magnesium. Um, so providers or doctors should work with their uh, patients if they're on any medications that are going to deplete these important cofactors that at a cellular level, your biochemical pathways require in order to work properly. Um, this is a, the, my favorite organelle is the mitochondria. It's my favorite. Um, and this here is an example. This is complex. You look at this, you might be intimidated by looking at this. But this is to show just how complex your human, the human body is. And there's so many biochemical pathways in a body that requires these nutrients, B vitamins, your vi vitamin C, your CoQ10, it's an antioxidant, your uh, lipoic acid is a B, it's a, um, not a B vitamin, it's an um, antioxidant that the, in the um, mitochondria requires, um, magnesium, all of these nutrients, this organelle requires. Why is this so important? Well, the mitochondria are the energy producing organelles of our cells. So they help us feel energy. And, 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 and this is the thing, if you're not feeling your best and you feel like you're, you don't have energy, it could just be that you're not feeding your cells. You're just not feeding your cells. Your body needs these nutrients. And the reality is you don't get it from the Western diet. You need to eat foods that are going to fuel your cells. And this is what is happening in our cells. The, these complex reactions. 
and they require cofactors in order to help drive the pathway so that you can have healthy cells, normal functioning cells. So plant bioactives, these are uh, phytochemicals that are found in our foods. They have biological activity. They're cardioprotective. They're also chemopreventative and help with fighting cancer. We have all kinds of um, phenolic compounds in our berries and um, polyphenols uh, in our um, grapes, such as resveratrol. And they have all kinds of benefits to the human body from helping to mitigate the effects of oxidative stress and inflammation that promotes uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer and, and obesity, improve insulin resistance, um, help to lower blood pressure. This is a, a chart showing some of the mechanisms by which flavonoids work in the body. They're antioxidant, they, they help to support antioxidant systems um, and help with the oxidative stress. That's the most important thing. When you have a chronic disease, you have oxidative stress and um, you have to make sure that you have a healthy reserve of antioxidants to help quench the oxidative stress. And if you don't have it, then these free reactive um, um, oxygen species or free radicals will go and get these, uh, they, they desire, these are reactive um, um, molecules that are extremely unstable and they go around looking for an electron uh, because they're extremely unstable. They desire to be stable. Well, that's where your antioxidants come from. And if you don't have a healthy reserve of antioxidants, then these free radicals are going to take the electron from your DNA and, and cause oxidation to your DNA, or it's going to cause um, ca get the electron from your cell membrane and cause lipid peroxidation. And we don't want that. We don't want any kind of damage um, to our DNA or the cells because that is going to promote uh, more disease, more oxidative stress, more injury um, to the cells. And so you want to make sure that you're eating these foods that are high in flavonoids because they have antioxidative properties. Um, the, uh, the flavonoids also, flavonoids also um, um, help with uh, lowering blood pressure. They, um, they, they help, they have so many benefits. They're anti-neoplastic. Um, they're amazing at being able to uh, stop the progression of cancer, inhibit um, angiogenesis and inhibit um, um, cell proliferation. So this is an example of the biological effects of resveratrol. It actually helps with uh, mitigating the effects of LDL oxidation, which is never a good thing. Um, it helps with the clearance of beta amyloid that plays a role in the plaques um, that's found in Alzheimer's. Um, and as you can see, resveratrol or any other polyphenols have the ability to affect or modulate our cardiovascular system and our neurological system. So we want to make sure that we're, in, we're eating these foods because of the, uh, the power that these, this type of nutrition gives our body. You want to slow blo uh, brain aging? Here we go. You got to increase these polyphenols in the diet because they can cross the blood brain barrier and provide neural protective effects on, on our brain. And remember when I talked about the advanced glycation end products, they, and how they can cross the blood brain barrier, you will have this oxidative stress being created um, in the brain. And that's what's going to help facilitate this Asian process that's happening. Um, and so if you get these blueberries in, these strawberries, all your berries, you can delay the Asian by up to two and a half years. So this is because these, these, um, the berries have these polyphenols that have antioxidative properties and it can quench the oxidative stress that's happening. Um, plant polyphenols have been studied in colorectal cancer. Um, they've found black raspberries can reduce um, by 50% the regression rate of rectal polyps and uh, reduce cell proliferation by downregulating some of the, the biochemical pathways uh, that allows the, the cancer 
um, to uh, manifest itself. And in this, in um, studies, they've used um, 45 grams per day of this black raspberry. Black raspberries, by the way, the ORAC is extremely high for black raspberries. They, they, they have a very high oxidative, um, oxidative power. Um, so you want to get black raspberries into the diet. Um, and, 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 and you, by doing so, when you eat them, uh, they make their way to the colon and they can actually help heal colon tissue. Um, they've been shown to uh, promote apoptosis of malignant cells and inhibit angiogenesis or blood vessel, uh, blood vessel development in um, um, malignant cells. Another important thing, so we talked about the LPS and how the LPS translocates into the cardiovascular system and um, can promote atherosclerosis. Here's the thing, you want to, in order to mitigate that and, and prevent this LPS from um, causing so much problems, you wanna balance the microbiome. And the only way to do that is to eat berries, polyphenols that are going to help to increase the lactobacillus and bifidobacterial species of the, 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 um, the colon. Um, they can outcompete this gram negative bacteria. And that's, that's part of the reasons why um, the LPS is entering into the, the bloodstream because you don't have enough of the beneficial bacteria that are supposed to be there to help neutralize this LPS. But the reason that's happening is because you're not, people aren't eating the berries. They're not eating the foods that are going to keep the, um, the, the beneficial bacteria present so that you uh, don't have the other um, gram negatives over uh, proliferating. So berries can modulate berries, uh, dietary polyphenols uh, can modulate the gut microbiome composition and function. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator, helps to produce a potent, a robust cardiovascular system. Um, and uh, L-citrulline, if you drink watermelon, you can help to, as a precursor to L-citrulline, as a precursor to nitric oxide. So are beets. Um, and uh, my favorite uh, cocktail for improving arterial function is to uh, take vitamin C, uh, vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid, and this helps to improve vascular function um, and protect the arteries against oxidative stress and injury, as well as eating foods that are rich in the phenolic compounds. Chronic exercise can also increase, increase nitric oxide um, and um, help with that uh, vasodilation. Aerobic training, uh, walking, jogging, stationary cycling, all of these are things that can help support nitric oxide production. There are so many phytochemicals, over 4,000 um, different types of phytonutrients and 8,000 polyphenols. We're finding out that there's so many more. And these, these plant compounds have such um, amazing effects on the body and lowering inflammation and the effects that the environment um, negative effects the environment has on our body. And we have more than 25,000 bioactive food constituents, and they play a role in um, virtually every aspect of our, our physiology. A very simple way to um, a qualitative assessment of your nutrition is to uh, use uh, nitric oxide strips. They're very uh, useful. You, this is a salivary uh, test strip and you're able to see um, how much nitric oxide your body's producing. And optimally you wanna be in that bright pink. And if you're not, then you know you should aim towards uh, increasing your nitric oxide in your diet. And um, just to put things into perspective here, when I did this for myself, I was consuming close to 10 cups of vegetables a day um, and to, to, to get to um, the optimal level of, of nitric oxide. So this is a very simple qualitative test that you can use uh, to, to get an idea of just how much dietary uh, nitric oxide 
you're actually um, you're getting in your diet. We're almost done here. Cruciferous vegetables are by far my favorite uh, veggies. Um, they are so powerful. They are packed with so much um, power in terms of their um, anti-neoplastic properties, meaning cancer. Uh, there was a study that looked at broccoli sprouts and um, these were in women who were undergoing breast augmentation and they found that uh, within an hour, of, these women were, they took in a quarter cup of broccoli sprout juice. And within an hour, they found an enormous amount of sulforaphane built up in the breast tissue. Um, this is, why is this important? It's because broccoli sprouts have 10 times higher the amount of sulforaphane. And um, they, they are very powerful at, um, uh, you know, fighting uh, cancer cells, uh, cancer uh, stem cells in particular, which is always an issue after you go through your treatment, you need to deal with these circulating tumor cells and um, broccoli sprouts are extremely powerful um, in that they are able to uh, deal with these, um, these circulating um, cells. And so uh, broccoli sprouts are uh, actually more powerful than um, in terms of the sulforaphane content than other cruciferous vegetables, but they're, they're extremely, extremely powerful um, um, uh, uh, foods, any cruciferous vegetable. And there was a study that actually looked at um, in African-American women that, that consumed um, um, uh, a serving of uh, uh, collard leaves, collard leaves, uh, that was shown to actually um, reduce uh, certain uh, ER, PR uh, uh, positive breast cancers. And so you want to make sure that you're getting these cruciferous vegetables in because they have such powerful um, impacts at a cellular level and being able to mitigate um, the, uh, the, the cancer cells as they're forming. We have 500 to 1,000 cancer cells that we're forming every day. And if you have these foods in a diet, then you, you'll be able to um, uh, benefit from the anti-neoplastic properties, being able to uh, uh, reduce uh, proliferation and angiogenesis if that is something that's happening. And um, most the most important thing is when I work with people with uh, breast cancer, they have to eat these uh, vegetables because they're so potent, um, uh, packed with all kinds of uh, phytochemicals. And um, sulforaphane is just one of those uh, phyto, important phytochemicals that are in these cruciferous veggies. Um, fiber is also a, a very important um, constituent of a diet you have to get fiber in. Um, it's a phytochelator. It binds heavy metals and um, carcinogens. It what's really important is serves as a substrate for as fermentable fiber for the gut microbiome. And in doing so, the gut microbiome produced these short chain fatty acids. And by the way, this is what helps with that LPS clearance as well. Um, it helps with cholesterol metabolism and it helps to bulk up the stool. Uh, in decreasing uh, transit. So making sure that you're eliminating is really important because if not, if you're not eliminating, then you're, uh, you're, you're having some, you're probably going to recirculate those fecal carcinogens, which are a problem. And it also plays a role in um, eliminating uh, toxic estrogen as well. So if, as estrogen is metabolized, it needs to be eliminated through the bowels. And um, that's sometimes an issue for some people uh, with estrogen. So dilute and fecal carcinogens and decrease in transit time uh, reduce this contact the fecal carcinogens have um, in con with the colon tissue, the colonocytes. 
And uh, flaxseed consumption is extremely beneficial in colon physiology and is associated re with a reduction in colorectal cancer um, and occurrence, reoccurrence. So it's, it's really important to get the fiber in. We have to get the fiber in because it does serve a biological purpose. And you simply do not get it from the Western diet. You just don't. Um, and so this is what I mean. We, we have to really redefine what nutrition is. Um, we need to redefine uh, what food means when we eat food, because it does serve a biological purpose. And we saw it with, with fiber. Fiber plays a really important role for the microbiome in clearing um, cholesterol, uh, oxidized cholesterol, and, um, and, and just a, a whole uh, list of things. I can go on and on about fiber. Um, this is interesting. Uh, there's um, this postulated causal link between constipation and increased colorectal cancer risk. Uh, the increased duration of contact between a colonic mucosa and concentrated carcinogens is what is uh, thought to be the reason why people develop colon cancer. Um, because constipation, again, if there's any stool that's sitting in the colon, you're causing the, the colonocytes to become in, to have contact, direct contact with these fecal carcinogens. And that's never a good thing because they undergo um, changes. And so this is the reason why having bowel movements are extremely critical. And this is another reason why we have to have that fiber that's going to stimulate bowel motility and push things out and not keep things stuck in the colon. So in summary, it's really important to increase phytonutrient density and diversity in the diet. And the reason why is because these foods help to uh, deal with this low-grade systemic inflammation that's associated with chronic diseases. This is why Janet got better, because she increased the phytonutrients in her diet. They were cardioprotective, antineoplastic, they support gut health. And another thing that's important to note is that gut health should be considered a therapeutic target when addressing chronic disease. When there's any dysbiosis or imbalance of the gut microbiome, then you could be at risk for this LPS leaking into the bloodstream and increasing your risk for cardiometabolic diseases and insulin resistance, high cholesterol, obesity. You want to restore your antioxidant systems and increase your micronutrient status to optimize physiology at a cellular level. We saw the role that some nutrients play in um, balancing um, our, uh, our cell processes facilitating their, um, their um, function. And so we want to make sure that we have these cofactors available. And then we want to remove the inflammatory foods and lifestyles that are facilitating disease process. And so this is where I'm ending. And I, I pray that this was something um, very um, encouraging and powerful uh, for people um, to know that you have the power to reach your state of optimal health, just like Janet. And that's what we specialize here on, true health, trying to educate everyone about um, lifestyle practices uh, that help bring you into the state of health that you deserve to have. You do not have to be a slave to any chronic disease. And I see it, I work with it all the time. And I really do believe that um, people can reach their state of optimal health if only they know what things impact their health and serve as triggers. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, honey, for uh, that presentation. You kind of saw a little bit of uh, what my wife does. And honey, I don't know if you were able to see the chat at all, but some really good feedback and um, also some good questions. You know, this is uh, this is kind of wisdom, folks, that that you need in order to live a healthy and long life. I mean, we're not just about general health around here; we're about longevity. 
And even if we made some mistakes in the past, not too late, we can still turn some things around. And uh, that's what we're aiming to do here on True Health Tuesday. So just like last week, we had some questions. We're going to do a little bit of Q&A right now. I see questions that are still coming in. I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, and Dr. Reynolds will give some answers to a few of your questions. We may have some time for, for more. Uh, if we don't, still go ahead and post just like last week to this particular video. And when you post in the comments below, we'll take a look at them throughout the week. And uh, in the future, we'll have uh, both of the doctors back on to answer uh, questions that are related to them. For now, uh, honey, we did have a few questions. One was from Jody, and she asked, can inflammation interfere with your ability to sleep? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I mean, it, if you have inflammation um, and it's connected to some kind of chronic disease, a lot of times uh, people with chronic illnesses have difficulty falling asleep. Um, sometimes if people's cortisol levels are too high in the evening um, or when they're asleep, their cortisol can spike. Excess cortisol is inflammatory. That can also um, play a role in um, impact in sleep. So and direct, there can be some um, indirect and direct um, correlations to inflammation and, and sleep quality sleep. Um, an, another thing that I, I often see too is when people have musculoskeletal conditions, um, arthritis, it, that's an inflammatory disease. And, and depending on the severity, these patients have a really hard time sleeping. So inflammation uh, can play uh, a, a role um, in a lot of times it's because people have conditions that are associated with inflammation that impacts their quality of sleep. Gotcha. Uh, Michelle is on Michelle Borg and she says that she feels fortunate to have you as her doctor. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, and a similar question, honey, comes in from Tracy and Tracy says, can back pain be caused by inflammation? Yeah. The reason why you have pain is because there is inflammation. Um, and so, we usually, one of the things I, I do is try to figure out, well, why do you have back pain? Um, sometimes it, it could be uh, something going on with your posture. Um, it can be um, lack of physical activity. The physical activity increased blood circulation to the, the spine and, um, and throughout the entire body. So um, if you're not active, if you're not hydrated, if you're um, you have bad posture. These are all things that can affect the back um, and promote um, inflammation. There's a number of things, a number of things. Okay, but, I, I'm going to have to step out of this room because we've got a little bit of an echo. So, um, how bad is the Let's see. I'll tell you what, why don't you mute yourself when I speak, okay, honey? Okay. And you all, let me know in the, in the chat, Sean, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, if you continue to hear an echo as we speak, I'm going to go ahead and mute my microphone when I'm not speaking. Let's get me on the screen so you can see who's talking. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Tricia. And uh, just keep us honest there if you hear anything, but you shouldn't anymore. Let me get to another question, honey. And this one's coming in from Janelle who asks, should you start diet or exercise first if you're someone who is struggling to get going? So this is somebody who's trying to get healthy, but they're mm -hmm. struggling in general. Which one should I start first, nutrition or exercise? Well, it's interesting because I think <laughs> that's an interesting question because I don't usually separate the two um, because they're both, they kind of work synergistically together. Um, but if you have to choose one, I would say change what you eat 
And, and to make that very simple, if you're just getting started, don't remove anything from the diet, increase the good stuff. That's it. Increase, um, go up a cup in greens a day, a cup in fruit a day, change what you're eating. Um, because I see that even with changing, um, you know, starting an exercise regimen, um, I see more impact with nutrition, just changing what you eat and not necessarily removing, just increasing the good stuff. That makes a big difference. Just changing what you eat and increasing the, the good stuff, the phytonutrients, the um, fiber, the antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, just making sure that you get that into the diet makes a huge impact. So. Okay, that sounds good. And actually, that makes it really simple, honey, because I can imagine if somebody's feeling overwhelmed, if the only nutrition change they're going to make is to just say add a smoothie in a green smoothie to increase their uh, vegetable count or maybe add a green smoothie and a big salad every day, then you can add your exercise in a lot easier that way without adding too much to your uh, work capacity. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I also want to mention too, that um, with exercise, you don't have to do much. Just go walk. Uh, walking is extremely um, healthy and you, uh, you don't have to do these fancy exercise routines um, to, to benefit from exercise. Now, of course, if there's any body transformation, you want to be extremely targeted. Um, there are certain types of exercises that, that um, tend to have more of an effect on uh, certain things that you're working on with the body. But, um, but yeah, um, yeah, you, you just start small start small and, and get walking. And I always encourage people to do, you can break up your walk in 10 minutes, three times a day. Uh, that will be add up to 30 minutes. Did you, <laughs> did you see Gigi's comment here? Gigi says, yes, I was so overwhelmed. I felt like I needed a PhD just to order dinner. <laughs> uh -oh. So, so we don't want anybody feeling like that. Um, yeah, this is a simple way to do it. Just add in the good stuff. And, I, you know, you would add in water too, right, honey? Plenty of water. Uh, there was a question about berries. Let me go to that really quickly here. The question was, uh, should, should we be temperate while eating berries if we have free radical damage? Or should we, you know, not eat, not overdo it on the berries? So I, I think, honey, th there's a couple of directions you can go here. Obviously, on the face of it, the question is, you know, should you be temperate? I guess when they say temperate and eating berries, they mean not eat too many berries. Um, but then also maybe a, a clarification of what free radical yeah. damage is, because they're assuming that only some people have it. So what do you, what do you got? Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing with berries is, um, is that the bioavailability of some of the polyphenols are low in a digestive tract. Um, and so you would, eating a lot of berries is not going to kill you. <laughs> it's not, it, it's not going to have any um, negative consequences. They're low in, um, in, um, uh, on the glycemic index. So you don't have to worry so much about it having a dramatic impact on your insulin. Um, and in, in terms of oxidative stress, uh, what that is, is this is a, a normal thing that happens in our cells. I'm, I'll explain this. So oxidative stress is something that naturally happens in the human body. It, it, it's, a, it's something that happens with our, re, our metabolism when we're breaking down food, when we're fighting viruses. Uh, this is what, what happens. And what's being created are these free radicals. And these are these uh, very, very unstable chemicals 
They're very unstable. And when they're unstable, um, and, and I should also mention when you have oxidative stress, there's, it needs to be balanced out with your antioxidants. And, um, and so if you don't have the oxidative stress modulated, meaning it doesn't get too severe or it's, you need a little bit of oxidative stress too. You create oxidative stress from breaking down your food, from exercise. This is something that normally happens in the human body. However, it, if, it, if it's not balanced properly, it can become damaging. And what happens is you start to have these free radicals that are building up and they're inflammatory and they go around creating problems in the body. If you don't have antioxidants to balance them out, then they go and take, um, you know, affect your DNA and affect your cells. So I, I just want to say that oxidative stress is something part of normal physiology, but it's when it gets out of hand, when it gets out of control, it becomes a problem. And you can mitigate the effects that it has by making sure that your antioxidant defense system is um, is adequate. Got it. Sounds good. There was a uh, another question here from uh, Gregory, and I think I'll take this one to start, honey. If you, you'll probably add to it. But Gregory asked. First of all, he said last week Dr. Swelt mentioned uh, that supplements are a myth. Do you believe some supplements are created equal, like ones with synthetic ingredients, uh, or are, I guess he was saying are not created equally? So first of all, last week what Dr. Swelt actually said, he did not say that supplements were a myth, but that taking a supplement will give you the full benefit of either melatonin or vitamin D, he was saying that that's myth. In other words, uh, you can't bottle up all of the benefits that melatonin provides when the body produces it naturally, and likewise with vitamin D. So he wasn't saying that supplements at large were a myth, but that if you, you know, the idea that taking vitamin D is equal to the benefits of the sun, getting outside in the sun. Exactly. Uh, so, honey, I'm sure you agree with that. Um, our, the other part of Gregory's question, though, was, do you think that there are levels to the value of supplementation? Are some supplements inferior to others? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I really like that question because um, this is something that I stress a lot to people I work with. Um, there's this thing where people supplement everything. They, there's so many supplements people are taking. And um, I think supplements have their, their role, but um, it's never, ever, you should never take a supplement to replace healthy eating. Never. Um, that is not something I support. I do use supplementation because I do uh, micronutrient testing. I do look at gut health and, um, and, uh, you know, cardio, uh, metabolic testing. I, I look at this and I can see what is happening at a cellular level with people's health. And here's the thing. If the body is crying out for help, if you don't have the basic nutrients that are going to fuel your cells, help the gut work better or, help um, your mitochondria work better, you might support uh, this person with a supplement. It, it, it can be really helpful um, because initially the body is in a state of imbalance. And if you, if you take a supplement, um, if, for example, vitamin C, vitamin C, you can get dietary vitamin C, but you can also supplement with vitamin C in a state of um, any kind of stress, or um, or if you have a viral uh, attack, you, you're, you're fighting a viral infection. And a, the reality, the, the reason why this is important is because when you are sick, and this is just an example 
of why you would supplement, your body uses so many nutrients. Vitamin C concentrates in white blood cells and it also con concentrates in the adrenals, okay? So if you have any kind of adrenal dysfunction or if you're under a lot of a great deal of stress, when you're stressed, you, you use way more nutrients. When you're sick, you burn through your vitamin D, you burn through your vitamin C. Vitamin C is water soluble. You're constantly excreting your water soluble vitamins. And if you're not replenishing these vitamins through your diet, then that's gonna, you're gonna run a risk of being um, deficient. And if you're on medications that are also further depleting these important nutrients, then you might want to supplement. So I do think that supplementation has its role and, um, and, but I do think some people are practicing polypharmacy. They are taking way too many supplements and they're not always well indicated. And I, it's just people are self uh, prescribing and they're not working with a, a doctor and making sure that they really, really need to be on the supplement. I was just looking at a stool test the other day. Um, and this person's, uh, was this person had, um, they were taking probiotics and I told them they had to stop their probiotics. Yeah. People take probiotics. They take a lot of supplements and have no idea that that's not even something that they're supposed to be taking. So it has its role, vitamins, minerals, um, supplementation have their roles. And, um, in terms of, uh, levels to supplementation, there are some quality supplements. I always encourage people to never purchase supplements from Amazon because Amazon, um, it, the, 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 you can't trust the uh, distributors and a lot of the products are contaminated. So I encourage people to uh, look at their, their products and make sure that they're third party tested so that you can ensure the quality of what you're taking um, is actually intended to help you, not hurt you. Um, so I think there's different levels to it. And I think um, supplementation should never, ever be used to replace a healthy diet and lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds great, honey, and makes a lot of sense. Um, let me take a look at another question. This one's coming from, uh, I believe, from a different Gregory who asks, how do you, or is there a way? Looks like I was muted while I was talking. <laughs> Let's get to another question. This one's from a different Gregory, I believe. And he asks, how do you check, or is there a way to check mitochondria for mitochondrial health? Yes, I, I do that a lot. And um, there's a, a test, it's, it's called um, a micronutrient uh, test. And it looks at your vitamins, your minerals. It also looks at your mitochondrial function. Toxic exposure as a very comprehensive nutrient evaluation. So um, the, the test is um, it's a, a, a micronutrient test. That's, that's all I can say. And it, the one that I use uh, will look at the mitochondria. And it's quite, quite useful. Okay, so it sounds like it does more than just that, but yeah. includes the mitochondria. The mitochondria as well as glutathione, all of the antioxidants that the uh, mitochondria needs to, to work properly. Got it. All right, sounds good. Uh, another question here is why does, and this is kind of a, a tough one, honey, but the question is why does stress make some people eat more? Uh, and I guess the context was, you know, it seems like stress impacts people in different ways. And for some people, it makes them overeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason why is because um, cortisol <laughs> is cortisol again. So um, cortisol, when you spike cortisol, it increases um, glucose into your cells and or not into your cells, but into your bloodstream um, because glucose or I shouldn't say glucose, but cortisol, cortisol stimulates the body to release glucose. And um, and then it also impacts um, when we're stressed too. when we're stressed, we tend to crave sugar. 
okay? We tend to, to crave sugar. We tend to eat foods that are more satisfying to the body um, and com they're more comforting because when you're stressed out or you're depressed, you, you tend to want those sugary foods. And, th and it makes sense because the cortisol causes you to, it's one of those hormones that um, if you're stressed out, you go into a fight or flight state. And when that happens, you're intended to run. Okay. You're supposed to run from this, this bear. And so what happens when you need to run, you need glucose, you need glucose into your um, cells. And so the, the easiest form of energy and sugar is, are these comfort foods, these foods that are, um, that will make you eat, you, you tend to eat a lot of because it's fast energy, it's fast sugar. So it's going to um, help drive glucose into your skeletal muscles so that you can run. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why stress causes you to eat. It's not, it's not that you just eat any, I, I want to be more specific, even with that question It's what you eat. So when you're stressed, how many of you are eating broccoli, right? It's certain types of foods that you're, you tend to crave and it's that high fat sugary stuff. And that's because that's energy. Fat is energy. Sugar's energy. It's going to give your, your cells the fuel that it needs to run. So that's the reason why stress makes you make you overeat, but you tend to eat high sugar and fat. <laughs> that's interesting. And actually, as you were talking about that, uh, it I was thinking that it does make sense because these foods um, also the body stores them, right? They, that types of that type of energy the body can store in its cells, and so it can come back later and retrieve that energy if it needs it for a future survival such scenario. So it makes a lot of sense, but we don't want to tell our bodies chronically that we're under stress because it'll continue to crave that sugary fat food and mm -hmm. continue to store those calories as well. Uh, Deborah asks, how soon will a change to healthy plant-based diet show results? So honey, imagine a person who's uh, been on the sad American diet for a long time, and now they've decided to go plant-based. How long would you expect for them to see some sort of results? From my own clinical experience, um, it can take up to two weeks to three weeks. Uh, maximum results are seen um, around eight weeks. But it's interesting because... Um, Within seven days, even though you may not feel it, but in seven days is, is dramatically impacting your arteries. Dr so mm. so sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the nutrition, you don't feel the effects of it until much longer, you know, later around two, three weeks. But within seven days, just in a week, there is transformation happening at a cellular level. Wow, that is powerful, and you 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 can see that reflected too, uh, sometimes in testing and so forth. Huh? Yes, I do. Um, when I, I do the testing, I can certainly see. in symptoms you can see people. Uh, oh, absolutely, um, Janet. I mean, she noticed an improvement just in um, seven days. She felt the difference because it was so dramatic. Her lifestyle prior. Um, and just making subtle changes was enough to, she really felt it. it was almost as if her body was crying out. I need this. <laughs> it was desperately crying out for help. All right, honey, I got a fun one here. It's about sea moss. Hold on to your seat. That says, uh, does sea moss really have most of the nutrients the human body needs? Mm -hmm. So a little bit of context for those of you who don't know, there's, there's a, uh, for, for decades now, there's been a push towards sea moss, Irish sea moss and other sea moss. And, and the theory is that it has a ton of nutrients. And some people even go to a city where they say, hey, man, you can live off of sea moss and just about nothing else. So, honey, what do you say? Does sea moss really have most of the nutrients that the body needs? It is a phytonutrient uh, dense source. 
Um, the the only thing I would say about CMOS is um, you want to make sure that it's sourced correctly because it does uh, it's like a sponge and it'll absorb a lot of um, toxins. So uh, the manufacturers, you have to just make sure that it's um, sourced properly and they do uh, testing on the CMOS to make sure that it's high quality. But if it is high quality, it is a really, really good source of vitamins and minerals. Um, and you want to get different colors of CMOS uh, because different colors have different um, types of nutrients that are beneficial. So I wouldn't just focus on one type. That's the beautiful thing about um, creation and the availability of the wonderful kingdom of plants. There's so many, uh, there's so much uh, in terms of diversity and you, you want to make sure that you're switching things up so that you can get a different type of array of um, nutrient profiles from these foods. So, so um, sea moss is terrific and it has a lot of things. It is an excellent nutrient source. All right. So another question is, any suggestions for my five-year-old son who will not eat any fruits or veggies? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't know uh, much about your son, um, but one thing I know with kids is that they, they like things to be fun. So cool cups or straws, um, kids like to drink from things that are colorful and um, bright colors. And so straws or um, neat, pretty cool cups can always be helpful. Another thing that I noticed too, is that having the kids involved in the act of making their food can be extremely um, helpful for kids. Make it fun, make it fun. Let them be a part of the process and expose them. And they'll naturally uh, want to be a part of making the food that they consume. So adding color, making it fun um, to make and finding little cool um, straws or cups that kids, maybe their favorite character. There's a, you know, my son likes um, Blippi and I, I had to kind of manipulate him a little bit and told him that this was Blippi's favorite drink and it worked. And he's, you know, um, I made a lentil soup the other day and uh, I told him this was Blippi's favorite um, grandmother's favorite dish. And he loved it all of a sudden and it worked. So <laughs> um, we have to figure out creative ways to, to encourage the kids to, um, eat these foods. Make it fun. All right. Good Good advice, honey. Uh, there's a, I did see another question here. Um, and that is, or from Yvonne, she asks, does water play an important role in bowel movements? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it plays a role in everything. It will help you to evacuate. You want to make sure. I usually um, encourage people to drink half their body weight in ounces, but it, of course, that's minimally because right now we're in summer and you're using way more water just from talking and walking. Um, so you want to make sure that you're drinking adequate water because it does facilitate the motility of the digestive tract and it helps to make it easy to have a bowel movement. And um, a very simple way of knowing if you have adequate water um, is to look at your stool. And if it's pebbles, if you have pebbles, then, and it, it appears are extreme, extremely dry, then you're, you're not drinking enough water. And, um, and, and there's this thing, you know, some people say, well, I'm having bowel movements every day. Um, but if you look at the quality of your stool, that might just, you might still be constipated, even though you're going every day. So, and that's because you need water. Water is really important. Um, and it's also important in nutrient assimilation as well. So you need water to help run your cells as well. 
Got it. So, honey, a couple of a few a few other questions here before we finish up. And uh, one is on the question of soy. This is coming from Joanne, who says, are soy-based foods any good in the diet? I have been getting conflicting information. Oh, boy. What do you say, honey? Soy? Yes? No? Yes. Soy is good. Organic soy. Um, the isoflavones, uh, phytochemicals in sight, soy are amazing. Um, they have anti-neoplastic properties as well. Um, and you know, it's, um, it's interesting because uh, this, I often, I get this question a lot in, in terms of, um, the phytoestrogen aspect of soy. And it's the, it's the same thing. Uh, these, these phytoestrogens in a soy can outcompete the, uh, toxic estrogen. Um, so you want to benefit from the isoflavones that are inside soy. You just have to make sure it's organically sourced. Now, what about for men, honey? You know, men don't need as much estrogen as women. So, and then well, sometimes yeah. women get too much. Well, too. you don't want too much. Yeah, you don't want too much. Well, are these the same types of uh, estrogen? No, it's actually the, the isoflavones help with prostate health as well. Okay, and you're saying that they compete with the other estrogen. Is that what yeah. I heard you say? Okay. They bind to the receptors. Very same easily. receptor. The estrogen receptors, yeah. Okay, and so that's that's a good thing, folks. All right, there's another question here before I finish up, and it is from Roy. And Roy, I'm going to adjust your question a little bit, and uh, just to make it fit within the confines of what we're talking about today. Roy asks, is there a natural, maybe nutritionally related, nutrition related treatment? uh for adhd or maybe treatment modality for adhd in children mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what do you say honey i think that uh, sometimes that diagnosis is is used too loosely um sometimes you have to look at thyroid health um if, if there's excess sugar in a diet or anemia um sometimes when there's any kind of um uh, organic disease process happening from an endocrine perspective, or if there's um, excess sugar in the diet, that can actually um, um, contribute to that condition. Omega-3 fatty acids, um, uh, making sure that you're, the, the child is, um, yeah, getting healthy fats, uh, cutting out any refined sugar that plays a role. And here's another thing. Let me, let me mention this too. This is um, a little nuanced, but gut health, gut health. I, I see it a lot. Um, when um, there's an over proliferation of yeast, or if there's an imbalance in the microbiome, um, the gut bacteria, you, there is this gut brain axis. And so um, a lot of times what's happening in the brain is uh, it find it, there's its roots are in the gut. So um, I know the question was about nutrition, but I expanded that to go beyond nutrition. It's not just what you're eating, but it might also have something to do with the digestive system, um, something in the, the gut that's actually causing um, some issues. And, and let me let me explain this. So in the digestive tract, we have um, we have all kinds of, you know, bacteria and you might have some yeast and there are different types of species of yeast that people have in their guts and they ferment, they they, they eat, they release waste products. These waste products can um, uh, cause impacts on the brain. So we need to examine gut health um, when it comes to uh, any, any condition affecting mood, um, affecting behavior. Th there's, um, there's a lot of information that we have um, in terms of the gut microbiome and, um, and how it impacts uh, brain health. Um, so uh, nutritionally, 
reduce the uh, refined sugars. So there is something to do with the diet. There is something to do. And I usually have people eliminate the refined sugars and also eliminate gluten, corn, and um, non-organic soy. All right. Thank you, honey. Good answer. Uh, I think that is pretty much what we have for today. <laughs> thank you, everyone. This was <clears throat> another amazing week for True Health Tuesdays. Honey, any other closing words you want to say before we take off? I want to encourage people that you do not have to be a slave to any chronic disease. And we saw today that 90 to 95 percent of disease Okay, 90 to 95 percent of disease is something that you have the power to um, um, you have the power to change. OK, you have the tools um, and you you learn today that um, a large portion of your health can dramatically Im improve just by changing uh, what you put into your body to help fuel your cells. Honey, and my apologies. There's one other question I do want you to take a whack at, and it's about protein powders. Um, this person asks, uh, you know, they